Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new year, 2024. We're kicking off today and the new year with a session on metadata filtering and vector database queries. My name is Neil Canungo. I'm your host. I'm joined by Ryan Sigler. Ryan, you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good to have you back, Ryan. We love your presentations. and I know you got a good one prepared for us today. Um, I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of uh, uh, some housekeeping, just some introduction slides while we wait for everyone to join, give people a couple minutes to join. Um, first thing I wanted to mention is that you can ask questions in the chat, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, ask your questions in the chat and we will answer them live for you. We would like to keep things interactive and engaging and this is a learning opportunity for everyone so don't hesitate if you have questions or uh, comments that come up so let's get started um first off i just want to let everyone know what kdbai is kdbai is a vector database that specializes in scalability and temporal analytics um, you can sign up for this at kdb.ai in your browser. There's a sign up in the top right. You'll be presented with three flexible op options for getting started. I recommend getting started with the KDB AI cloud. That's just a simple sign up. We'll provision an instance for you. You'll get uh, four gigs of memory, 30 gigs of storage. Um, this is a, you know, a much superior offering to uh, many other vector databases out there for a free tier. Uh, there is no expiration on this free tier uh, as long as you're actively using KDB AI um, cloud. We will continue to keep your instance running for you. So it's a great way to experiment and try your different projects out. Uh, there is KDB AI server. Uh, if you are willing to, you're ready to uh, deploy on your local instance or a virtual private cloud. Those don't have scalability limitations, so you can scale for more memory and storage if you need it. And then we have KDBI server integrated in the Azure AI tech stack. So just to let you know, those are our three sign-up options. When you sign up, you'll be presented with a form to enter in your information, and then you'll get an email to verify your, e uh, your email address. You click that link, and then you'll be presented with another email on getting started with KDBI AI and how to log in. Um, once you log in, you will uh, be able to see your API endpoints and your API keys. Uh, be sure to copy those keys somewhere locally so that you can access them once you see your API key and register it. Um, it will be hidden from you in the UI. Just to let you know, we have launched a new uh, UI experience for a quick start. Um, this has code snippets for creating tables, doing similarity searches, connecting to the database. So it's easier than ever to get started with KDB AI. Uh, you log in, you have a guided walkthrough on uh, what uh, code snippets you can use and your IDE of choice it is all Python based. Um, there are also REST API endpoints as well that you can use. So um, with that, I wanted to also mention that these sessions are recorded in, they are on our YouTube channel. So youtube.com forward slash at KX systems. If you go to our KX YouTube channel, you can watch this session um, in perpetuity after it airs. And lastly, I wanted to mention uh, our Slack channel. Uh, this is a great community we have been building up. We have nearly a thousand people on our Slack channel today. Uh, we are releasing new updates to KDB AI. We talk about that in there. We also answer any questions you might have on RAG or metadata filtering, fine tuning, um, doing similar searches, distance metrics, things like that. So if you're, if you're uh, joining our universe, I highly recommend joining the Slack. And even if you're not a user of KDB AI, it's a good Slack to be a part of. So uh, with that, um, uh, let's get on to our feature session. Ryan, do you want to kick us off with uh, some metadata filtering? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Neil. Appreciate that. And um, welcome to the presentation, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Sigler, and I'm a data scientist here at KX. And, uh, you know, my goal 
with this presentation is hopefully to teach you something useful that you could walk away having learned something about uh, metadata filtering as a whole and also about KDB AI. But we want to try to be a part of this generative AI community and be contributing to that. Uh, so that's that's a big part of why I'm here today as well. Uh, but with with that, let's let's get into uh, the presentation. And the agenda for the day is first, I'm going to just give a brief overview of vector databases and and what a vector database is, what KDB AI is, and just just to make sure that we're all on the same base level as we move into understanding a little bit more about using a vector database for similarity searches or vector searches. And then uh, one way to improve those vector searches to make them more efficient is using metadata filtering. So that's sort of the, the highlight concept of the day. Um, but then we'll move into uh, a couple of interesting ways to do some automatic metadata tagging and behind the scenes metadata filtering using large language models. Uh, by a couple of uh, different frameworks like Langchain and Llama Index. And then uh, we'll talk about time-based filtering, which is one of the key benefits of using KDB AI. And I'll talk about that a little bit more then. But at the end of the presentation, I'll give a, uh, a walkthrough of, of, a, of a code demo that demonstrates how to do metadata filtering. And you'll see it's it's actually quite easy to do, but it can have uh, some significant improvements on your similarity searches. All right, so uh, just a quick intro on KDB AI. So it's a vector database and uh, vector databases in general are used to store vector embeddings, which are representations of raw data. So that could be a variety of different data types, uh, text, audio, images, video, any of that, that can all be stored and represented in a vector database. Uh, but one of the uh, advantages, I would say, that KDB that AI has is uh, the ability to uh, store temporal and time series data as well. So it inherently supports date time data types, which uh, you'd be surprised not not many vector databases do support those, uh, but it supports those. So you can import um, all sorts of types of data that have uh, like time and date metadata attached to them, like time series data and other types of data as well. So uh, those are a couple of the advantages of KDB AI, but in general, uh, vector databases, you know, they've, they've really become quite popular lately. And uh, there's many that have been popping up but um, really, one of the main reasons is because we can use a vector database as a method to introduce uh, our own data, whether it's enterprise data or personal data, uh, to large language models. And it works as the middleman, if you will, uh, to introduce that data to our large language models. So that's one of the key use cases that we can use vector databases for today alongside uh, things like anomaly detection, pattern similarity detection, uh, and things like that. So uh, with that, let's talk about vector databases and how they work at a high level architectural view. So vector database over on the right here, this is a database that stores vectors, of course. And uh, what that means is we can take whatever type of data that we have, whether it's video, audio, images, text, and we can store that data in the form of vector embeddings into our vector database. So how we go about that is we take our source data and we run it through an embedding model. An embedding model is just a deep learning uh, model that takes in raw data and outputs that data in the form of a vector embedding. And the benefits of having that data in a vector embedding is that it inherently stores the context and the importance and relationship between uh, different words, for example, uh, from the original data. So it's, it's actually not just like telling you about keywords that are in the data, it's telling you and storing the meaning, uh, the semantic meaning of the original data within a numeric format. And the beauty of that is we can store um, the context in a numeric format, which is easily machine readable. And this represents a vector. And if we think about, you know, back to math class, a vector, a 2D vector, a 3D vector, just a, 
an arrow pointing through space with a direction and a magnitude. Well, these vector embeddings are similar, but they're uh, high dimensional. So instead of just being two or three dimensions, they're thousands, hundreds or thousands of dimensions. And of course, that's sort of hard to picture um, in our brains, but uh, computers can can do this relatively easily. And then we can store these vectors within the vector database. So at this point, everything, all the data that we have is stored in the vector embedded format in our vector database. And we can do semantic similarity searches on that data to retrieve the most relevant vectors. And that's that's really the, uh, the key benefit is being able to retrieve relevant vectors from a vector database, depending given a user's question or user's query. So uh, if we take a closer look at what a search looks like uh, on our vector databases, you can kind of picture it in this 2D uh, view here where the yellow dots represent vectors in our vector database. And then a query vector is compared to all these vectors. And that's using a method called vector search or similarity search, where you can use different methods to do that comparison, including uh, Euclidean distance, cosine similarity, and dot product, which are supported in kdb.ai. Uh, but all this does is find the most relevant or the most related vectors to a query vector. And then we can return the top K results. So we say we want to return the top three most relevant vectors. Then uh, we can do that uh, with these similarity searches and return the top three. But uh, this is great. And this actually does work very uh, quickly and efficiently. It's a very fast way to search a lot of data but how can we even improve this further? And uh, one of the ways that we can improve this further is using metadata filtering. So in metadata filtering, what we're doing is we're looking at all the vectors in a vector database, and we see that the vectors can potentially have additional uh, metadata attached to them. And what that means is they can have a each vector can have an additional number of columns uh, of additional data attached to it. And because of that, we can use those additional columns of data to do some filtering. And the benefit of filtering is that we take our, uh, our search space, which contains all of our vectors, and we shrink that search space. So instead of having to search through all the vectors in the vector database to find the most relevant ones, we only need to search through a much smaller subset of those that meet those filters requirements. So if we look, we look flow here. Flow. And that, uh, just to add that, that helps in not just performance, but also accuracy of your results because you're able to reduce your search space to specifically what you're, you're trying to find. So performance and accuracy addressed by metadata filtering. Exactly. Yeah, and that's those are really the, the, the two main benefits is, is the speed and the accuracy. And when we look through how, you know, this flow um, sort of goes, when a user is querying a vector database, uh, typically they would just uh, give a natural language query asking a question about the vectors in the database. That query is embedded the same way as all of our data was embedded. And then we do that similarity search between the vector database and the query vector to find those most relevant vectors. But when we add the filtering aspect to it, what it does is it takes that vector space, it applies the filter to it, and therefore shrinks the filtered space. So if we think about this in, in the context of just this simple picture, uh, we could apply a filter that says, hey, I'm only interested in the white squares, for example and we're going to filter out everything else. So now, instead of having to do a similarity search across all of these vectors, we only are doing the similarity search across the white squares here. So this obviously shows we're searching over far fewer vectors, which therefore will increase the speed of our vector searches. And of course, like Neil mentioned, increase the accuracy. And then the, the output is the same is simply uh, giving your top two most relevant similarity matches. So um, if you're familiar with SQL, this really is, is quite similar to a SQL where statement. So in KDB AI, uh, there are several functions available for you to use for metadata filtering. And uh, if you're interested in 
you know, learning about all these different functions, you can go to kdb.ai and check out the documentation. All of this is listed in there. Um, but you you have the ability to build out you know whatever type of filter that you need to depending on your use case so that this is all available inherently built in within uh kdb ai okay so we've talked about it at a high level now how does this actually work in like let's look at a code snippet to, to understand this a little bit further so like i mentioned uh the vectors in a vector database or the embeddings, they can be tagged with additional metadata fields. So metadata is just data that tells us more information about the embeddings in this case. So you could have things like names, types, descriptions, genres, dates, categories, all of these things could be attached as additional columns to our vector embedding. So if we take a look at this table schema, and, and we'll be uh, actually doing this in code at, at the uh, end of the presentation. But if we think about a database that contains movies and uh, we can look at all of these columns and, and each movie has each of these associated with it. But uh, as far as the vector portion of this, we have a column down here that is our vector embeddings column. And this is how you would set up a table in KDB AI. So in this case, I'm taking the plot of each movie, I'm running that through an embedding model and storing those embeddings in this column. And the nice thing about doing this is we have a lot of flexibility about how we're setting up uh, our vectors and our, our vector search and our vector index. So first of all, we need to define what number of dimensions we're working with. And uh, that's based on the embedding model that we use. Uh, next, you can define the search metric. So like I mentioned, there's different similarity search methods that we can use, Euclidean distance, dot product, cosine similarity. You could pick whatever one of those you want. And then you can pick uh, an index type. So you could use just a flat index or HMSW. Um, so you, you have options to how you structure this embedding. However, the additional information, this is still relevant. And this is going to help us when we want to do a uh, filter on our queries. So if we look at an example query, uh, we're going to be searching our vector database. And there's three key things that we need to have in our uh, search query. The first one is the actual query vector itself. So this is where you take your natural text question that you're asking to the vector database and you transform that into a vector embedding. That vector embedding is, is the query vector. The second thing is n equals three. And this is just saying we're going to be returning the top three most relevant results that we get from this search. And then the final thing is the actual filter that we're applying to the client mm -hmm. database. So we can do, um, you know, for example, let's look for a director, George Lucas, and the release year 1977. So if you think about a vector database that has, you know, tens of thousands of movies in it, and then we are reducing that space down to only the movies that have George Lucas as a director and only movies that were released in 1977. All of a sudden, you've reduced that search space massively. Um, so as as you scale up your vector database to you know thousands, millions of vectors, uh, the more benefit that this uh, filtering is going to provide you because it's going to significantly reduce that search space. And Ryan, we had a question, and um, I think we touched on this a little bit, but it's good to highlight again. Yeah. Uh, so Joe was asking, can we only store strings in the metadata? And I think the answer to that is uh, no, you can store integers and floats. And uh, with KDB AI, one of its uh, key advantages is that you can store date times as well as uh, temporal data, right? Exactly. Yeah, you can you can store that. There's there's a list on the documentation that you could look at for all of the data types but yeah any any of the common data types you're going to be able to store as metadata in here so it's very right. customizable uh, to whatever use case that you have and then um julian was asking if there'll be a recording just a quick reminder to everyone there is a recording uh that will be on our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash at kx system so just a quick reminder for those that might have missed that in the intro um, all of our sessions are uh, are um, hosted on YouTube after they air. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. 
No, no problem. Thanks, thanks for the questions and keep them coming. We're happy, we're happy to answer. All right. So um, yeah, this is a, just a, a code snippet example of how you can do metadata filtering within KDB AI. It's pretty simple to set up, and uh, we'll be demoing it that further in a little bit. So um, let's take this a, a step further, and there's a couple uh, frameworks available out there to to you as uh, which are Langchain and Llama Index. These are two open source frameworks that you can use uh, to build applications with large language models. And uh, one of the retrievers that they have, and a retriever is just a method to get uh, the most relevant information in order to send that to a vector database or to a, an LLM. Uh, they have retrievers that are specifically designed to automatically uh, tag metadata based on a user's query and then apply a filter on a vector search. So this would all happen behind the scenes for you. And, and how this would work is that uh, you would present the large language model uh, with all of the metadata field information that you're interested in. So say, you know, in, in the same topic of movies, you know, you might have the genre, the year, the director, and the rating. Then you'd provide a description of what this metadata field is and then the type that you're interested in. And uh, then the LLM will understand the types of metadata that it should be looking for. And when the user sends a query, it would be able to automatically tag that. And this means that you would no longer need to uh, write a custom uh, filter by hand for every query that you're making. So like an example here would be, I want to watch a movie rated, rated higher than 8.5. The LLM should be able to decipher, okay, uh, 8.5 is the rating and we want to look at movies that are only greater than 8.5. So it should be able to build that filter behind the scenes for us. So a uh, couple options out there for you if you're interested in like taking this to the next level uh, with metadata filtering. Okay, so uh, like we've mentioned a few times, uh, time-based filtering is a key capability that KDB AI has. And all that is, is using dates and times as the search filters uh, to increase the relevancy of the results that we're getting back uh, from, from the vector database. Uh, so like just some easy examples, uh, you know, when was the document created? When was it published? Uh, when was it last updated? This could work with time series data, social media posts, you know, every anything that could have time associated with it, uh, you can store in KDB.ai and use the inherently built in uh, date time data types that are available to you. Uh, so this is nice because you can do similarity searches with time range filters, you know, I'm looking for articles within this time range, or I'm looking for social media posts within the last hour or something like that. So it, it, it gives you the flexibility to define filters uh, based on dates and times. And then you could also do a similar thing with these uh, auto retrieval and self query retrieval methods, where you could give the large language model your metadata scheme, which would include those date times. And then the LLM might, you know, would be able to infer uh, a filter based on the query. Um, so it would be able to do that automatically and in the background. Just you're, it, This obviously comes at a bit of a cost because you're doing an LLM call up front to identify these metadata filters and then create a actual filter to send to your vector database. So it's a give and a take, right, with, with something like that. Okay, so uh, the, the last concept I'm going to uh, dive into in the presentation is RAG and metadata filtering. So RAG has become uh, quite a popular topic and for good reason, because uh, really the point of retrieval augmented generation is to be able to take your own data and then present that to a large language model so it can answer questions and queries about your data. and by themselves, a large language model isn't going to be able to do this. So we need to have a method to provide the relevant data to it. So then it can answer questions about uh, data that it hasn't been trained on. So this happens in two key steps. And I'm just going to do a, a quick high level overview of RAG uh, and then talk about how metadata filtering applies. But if you're interested 
and like a deep dive, uh, check out the YouTube page. I did uh, a presentation that goes into several different methodologies of using RAG and how to optimize it. Um, but there's two key steps, uh, retrieval and generation. And the retrieval step is when we're querying our vector database to get the most relevant data. So how we would set this up is we would take our data, whatever it may be, and then we would split that data up into smaller pieces. And we do that just because uh, we want to make sure that these pieces are easily digestible and fit within the large language models context window. Uh, because large language models do have a limit to how much information you can send in at once. So once we chunk that up, then we take those chunks and we embed them uh, into our uh, vector embeddings. And these vector embeddings are then stored within our vector database. So at this point, we have all of our data stored as vector embeddings in our vector database. Then the user sends whatever query they want related to our data set. That query is embedded the same way as these vectors were embedded above. And you can do your similarity search between the user vector user query vector and the vector database to retrieve most relevant results. So that's retrieval. Generation then, the second step, is taking this uh, relevant and contextual data and augmenting or providing it to a large language model so it can answer questions about it. And that means it would be provided our relevant data as well as the user query. And now the large language model is able to provide a response to the user about data that it was not trained on. So that's, that's RAG at a high level. But how can we use metadata filtering to uh, improve this process? And, and there's many methods to improve RAG, but this is, this is one that could improve the retrieval side of things. Um, so when the user's querying, A, they could send in a custom uh, filter themselves, or B, they could use, or you know, the developer could set it up so you could use self-query retrieval or auto-retrieval to automatically do this. And then when you're doing that similarity search, uh, you're going to be shrinking the search space, just like we talked about before. You're just making the uh, similarity search happen faster and more accurately. So uh, really at the core of this, you're just uh, using this as a method to improve this similarity search right here to get faster and more accurate results to send to our large language model. So that is how we can use metadata filtering in the context of retrieval augmented generation. All right, so I know Neil mentioned this uh, a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, but uh, just a reminder, there's a few different ways that you can access KDB AI and do so for free. So uh, we have the cloud version, there's a server version, and then there's a version on Azure. Um, you know, to get started, I, I agree with Neil, uh, you know, check out the cloud version. It's really easy. You can go and sign up. Um, and, and the nice thing is we have sample notebooks available on our GitHub. So if you wanted to get this set up and run a sample notebook, uh, like creating a retrieval augmented generation pipeline, I mean, you could get this done in a matter of minutes from scratch. So uh, it's it's easy to get started. And I think you'll find it pretty interesting if uh, to get your hands dirty and, and try, it try it out. out. OK, so that is the slide presentation for the day. Uh, so appreciate you tuning in. And now let's dive into some code. All right. OK, so I'm going to zoom in a bit here, try to make this a little bit more. Is that OK? That looks good. Yeah, it looks great. OK, perfect. All right, so this notebook is going through how we can do some uh, metadata filtering with the KDB AI vector database. And I did a few of the imports and stuff before, so we, we don't have to spend time doing that. But um, what we're going to do is do our necessary imports. Uh, we have our uh, OpenAI API key, which I already put in here. Um, and then we're going to set our large language model that we're going to be using as GPT 3.5 Turbo, which is a version of chat GPT. So first things first, let's uh, import the data set that we're going to be working with. I just have this as a pickle file, which stores a data frame. And if we take a look, let's do a little data exploration to understand, you know, what are we looking at here? Uh, the data frame has 19,000 rows. And if we look at the different columns we have available, 
um, these are all of the columns that are in that data frame. So uh, we have these metadata fields, which are released to your title, origin, which is the country of movie, uh, the director, the cast, the genre, and the plot. And then we have our embeddings um, also started here. And those embeddings are the embeddings of the plot. So if we just take a look at this data, we can see that uh, all of this information is in here. And the last column is our embeddings column. Now, I just wanted to mention the reason that I did the embeddings uh, beforehand was because there's like uh, 20,000 rows. It takes a couple minutes to do this. I didn't want to spend time during the presentation uh, waiting for the embedding model to go. Um, but if you're interested, you know, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and or on the Slack channel, and, and I'm happy to, to talk more about embeddings as well. Um, but here's our data set. This is our data frame that we're going to be working with, holding uh, about 19,000 uh, different movies in here. So uh, just a fun little uh, demo I wanted to show uh, before getting into the metadata filtering is this idea of using Pandas AI, which is a... Uh, it's a, a module that you can use to uh, write pandas for you behind the scenes. And it uses a large language model to, to do that. So the beauty of this is you can write a natural language query, for example, and then uh, it will behind the scenes write uh, your pandas code and uh, produce the answer for you. So like if we're looking at which directors have directed the most movies, we just have to access the natural language about that data set. And it's actually able to give a result for you automatically. So it, it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a fun way to uh, explore a data set. Um, I think, you know, you do need to be a little bit careful and just confirm the results that you're getting um, before, you know, you would do anything significant with them, but, I think to get started and to get understanding your data set, uh, it's kind of a fun way to do it. So, you know, you can ask questions like, you know, list, list all the uh, origin countries. So all the countries that are in this data set and what is the most popular genre in each country. So a little bit more of a complex query than the previous one. And it's able to show you, you know, the, um, the American movies, uh, the genre is the most popular genre is comedy, for example. So, um, you're able to build out a, a good understanding of your data set using natural language. Uh, and it can also uh, create a graph for you. So, you know, what are the five most popular movie genres? Make a graph of the result. And you can see here it will uh, reach out and create a graph for you of the result. And you can do all sorts of custom stuff. You can say make the bars different colors. You can ask it to make a different type of graph. Um, so lots of flexibility there. Um, but let's uh, let's get into the actual uh, vector database stuff and the metadata filtering stuff now. And now that we have a good understanding of the data set that we're working with, um, let's do the imports that we need to to get our KDB AI vector database set up. So the first thing we do is import what we need. And then I've already done this because I had to put in uh, some API key information, but this is setting up our KDBI endpoint and KDBI API key, which once you sign up for KDB AI, you get access to both of these things. And then all we need to do is connect to our session. So at this point, we are now connected to KDB.ai. So now that we're connected, we want to create a table schema. And this is the format of the table that will be created uh, within KDB AI. And like I mentioned, there's several different fields here, but the embeddings field, this is where your actual vector embeddings are stored. And this is the field where, uh, where you're doing that vector similarity search on. You can define your dimensions, which of course depends on your embedding model, the different uh, similarity methods you want to use and the type of index that you're interested in using. You can all customize this easily here. But here's the metadata fields that we're going to be working with. So movie data set, you have release your title, origin, director, cast, genre, and add plot. So these are your uh, metadata fields, and this is your embedding field, and this is overall the schema of the table that you're creating. 
And then while we're on this topic, uh, Tomas had a question um, on the typical dimensions of vector embeddings. Is similarity well defined in these high dimensional spaces or is it a limiting factor? So I, I would say that the typical dimensions are, are a kind of that middle answer of it depends on, um, you know, what your trade-off is on storage, mm -hmm. lo uh, longer, uh, higher dimensions, you're going to have more storage space, also more compute with your similarity searches. Um, with lower dimensions, you will, you, you won't have those factors um, affecting you as much, but you may not get the quality of search results back. So right. um, on your use case and how high of accuracy you're looking for in your similarity searches, that's that's my knowledge. And Ryan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, it, it's, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. The uh, w One of the interesting things actually related to this question is OpenAI just released like within the last week, a couple new embedding models. Um, and they actually have the capability. Well, first of all, there's a smaller one and then a larger one. But they actually have the capability where you can customize the number of dimensions. So they have, um, you know, I think the large one is 3,072 dimension stock. But you can actually take that and reduce it if you chose to do so to save on that memory footprint. And you're sacrificing a little bit of accuracy in those embeddings uh, for a smaller memory footprint and potentially a faster similarity search because you're working with less dimensions. So it just depends on the use case. You know, really, it would probably take uh, a bit of trial and error and experimentation to find out which embedding model you'd like to use the most. And even in some cases, you might think about even fine tuning an embedding model. So mm -hmm. um, I, I know that's kind of a, a wide range of answers, if you will, but uh, hopefully, you yeah, know, hopefully that helped you out a little bit. Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, we got our table set up and uh, now let's actually create the table. So the first thing we need to do is uh, we need to check if a table has been created already in KDB AI. And if it has been, we're just gonna delete it for now so we can restart from scratch. So this will just take a few seconds to run, um, just ensuring that if there is a table, it gets deleted. So now we know there's not a table with this table name in KDB AI. So let's go ahead and create a new table called metadata demo using that table schema that we have just defined right here. So um, this is gonna go out, it's gonna create the table in KDB.ai. And um, if we take a look, I think this will work. You can see, yep, we created it. It tells us our, uh, our index type and our distant metric uh, Euclidean distance in this case, and then the dimensions right here. So you can easily see the tables there. So uh, we got our table created. Now let's let's import some data. So we're going to take our data set and we're going to um, import it uh, just in batches of, of 2000, just because there's so many. So we'll just split it up in the chunks of 2000. And um, what this is doing is loading those chunks into our vector database and into our KDB AI table. So this will just take a few seconds to do that. What's interesting is um, if you, while this is running, if you go back to your uh, KDB AI tab, um, just to let everyone know, you can now view your tables in the UI directly and delete those tables directly from the UI. Uh, and this is part of an effort to um, have more cred operations and the user experience. So the beginning is just deleting the tables and viewing the tables, but um, that makes it a little bit easier to manage your data. So just a heads up on that, that was uh, just recently added into the user experience. Perfect. Okay, so we've, uh, we've inserted our data now. And um, let's let's take a look at it. Just make sure it's it's in there. All right. So we're gonna write a uh, just a quick helper function to show this data, and then we're gonna run it. And this takes a second, and then we will be able to see that within our vector database, we have all of our data. All right. So now we know our data is loaded, and now let's query it. So. 
first things first, we need to use an embedding model. And this is the same embedding model that I used for embedding all of the movie plots. But um, we use this embedding model because we need to take the natural language query and then embed that in a query vector. So uh, you see this, this step right here where we're using this embedding model to encode whatever natural language query we want to try. So in this case, I'm just saying Star Wars Luke Skywalker will embed that query. And now we're passing in that query vector as well as we want to get the top three uh, most related vectors. So I'll run that and we see, okay, it did pretty good. Just with the natural language query itself, it was able to get uh, all Star Wars movies in the top three. So nice, that worked pretty good. But now uh, let's add a filter. Um, so in this case, we'll add the director of George Lucas and the release here of 1977 as additional filters with the same query vector and the same number of return results. And this time we get uh, A New Hope back, which is the original Star Wars movie, 1977. George Lucas is the director. And even though we, w we said we could have up to three results, uh, we're only getting one back because there's only one that matched these filters that we have specified. So okay. you can do this search without a metadata filter. Right. That would, that would find the, it, it would take a little bit longer, but it would be able to search contextually across your embeddings and find this one movie, this one film. But by restricting the metadata filter, you're almost doing like a, keyword type search and explicit search on that right. data that you can then use in your rag or uh, your rag pipelines or your other applications as well so it's kind of a uh, um, a blended approach where you can still have the benefits of similarity search in a vector database where you're searching context of what's in the plots but but you also have the option of doing metadata filtering where you can search just the specific characteristics of those embedding. So it's, that seems very useful. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a uh, great description of that. Um, so we did, we did it, we did one filter and let, let's try one more just to see what this looks like. And uh, we'll have a query vector um, that has uh, conspiracy theories involving art kind of high level, not, super specific to any particular movie it doesn't seem um and then let's let's do a query on this so we're gonna but we'll add some filters here so let's look for movies that are thrillers and hey let's try tom hanks as in the cast and see what happens so uh here's what we get back and the movie i kind of had in mind when i wrote this query was the da vinci code and it actually returned number one so um even, even with a higher level query that doesn't really dive it too much into like characters of the plot, uh, it, it still can do a pretty good job at retrieving the correct vectors, especially if you add some filters along with it. Okay, and then one more. Um, make a query vector for Middle Earth Fantasy Adventure in the Shire. So obviously referencing the Lord of the Rings series here. And um, if we do the uh, similarity search, we can add a filter. This is within uh, the release years of 2000 to 2010. And we can see that it's able to return those three Lord of the Rings movies that were released in 2001, two and three. So um, that is the code demo for the day. And um, really appreciate you all uh, joining in and checking it out. And then uh, just the last thing we'd like to do uh, when we're done with our demos is just drop that table uh, just so it's, it's good practices to drop it if we're done using it, save, uh, save memory and space and all that good stuff. So that is the demo. Thank you all and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, please put your questions in the chat. And just to remind everyone, again, uh, sessions are recorded. Well, find them at youtube.com forward slash at KX systems. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get notifications when new sessions are announced. And uh, uh, as we, not all of our uh, content is live sessions. We do just post videos on different topics. So you'll get those, um, those uh, updates as well. 
And a, uh, another uh, a quick uh, plug is for our Slack channel or Slack workspace. Uh, that's KDBA, KDBAI dash community dot slack dot com so anyone can join this uh we have a, about a thousand members in the community today and you can ask questions from the sessions or as you're getting started with kdbai you can ask all that in there now our next session is uh we're gonna have ryan back for multimodal rag for images and text so this has been a hot topic with retrieval augmented generation how do you combine different data formats images video audio text and do uh, retrieval augmented generation with generating those type of outputs and using those type of inputs. So Ryan's going to show a couple different approaches to that. And um, we will do that on February 14th. On February 28th, we are going to do uh, something on small language models and uh, their applications. And um, we will also, um, we're looking at getting another session in sometime in between there on RAG pain points, um, so challenges with RAG and how to address them. So stay tuned for that. I did put a link for the multimodal RAG session in the comments of this uh, event, so you can find the link right there, or follow our page KX on uh, LinkedIn and you can get the link there. Um, we will get these out to you in a little better format. We're starting a newsletter this month and. I'll share the sign up link for that next uh, next session on how you can sign up for a newsletter and get updates. Um, so um, that I'm just looking through the questions. Um, yeah, uh, so I think I addressed all the questions there. Um, just something that might be a little fun. Did you drop your table, Ryan? Because someone had a question on doing a search in second uh, no. record. No, I did not drop it. We can, get, we can give that a try real quick. I don't know if it's in the plot, but um, someone was asking. Yeah, see, that's the real question. Is it in the plot? I don't know if it's in the plot. So. Yes. If we, so, so someone was asking, Dr. Snuggles, great name, was wondering if a search of Second Breakfast would find Lord of the Rings too. Now, now if we had the uh, scripts loaded as embeddings in in the uh, vector database, it probably would. Right. But if it's not in the plot summary, it probably wouldn't pull yeah. it up because it wouldn't have that context. So, but funny okay. question. I like that, Doctor Snuggles. Um, let me see. Well, you're, uh, let's just try for fun. Nope, yeah. I don't think it's in there. <laughs> but yeah, if you had the script, it probably would work. Yeah, if you had the script, the movie script, yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah, that was a fun little search. So, you know, this notebook, uh, if you want access to this notebook, it is on our GitHub, right, Ryan? Yep, it's up there in the samples. So you can go on our GitHub, KDBI-samples, and there's this one, there's a rag example, uh, there's an image similarity example, there's a ton of different examples up there, and it's easy to get started, so check it out. Yeah, if you need help finding any of that, just message us on LinkedIn. Um, thanks again for joining today, and thanks, Ryan, for the great presentation. Uh, we hope to see everyone on our next session, February 14th, Valentine's Day here in the U.S. So we'll show some rag love with multimodal <laughs> rag. All right, that's enough dad jokes for me today. Have a good one, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.